key players already undefeated, but we'll get a chance to see some of our top players in our feature match area right now as we head back down to the feature match area for a little bit more magic. Hello and welcome to this round seven here of Grand Prix Prague. We have Lawrence Caligaro on Titan Shift up against Ben Sek, uh, who is playing a version of Hardened Scales that is, even amongst the Hardened Scales decks, <laughs> a little bit different. Yeah, uh, well, the Hardened Scales deck by itself is already a relatively new addition to the competitive modern uh, uh, format. Uh, it's not so much affinity, because it doesn't run cards like Springleaf Drum or uh, Ornithopter to get as many artifacts onto the battlefield, blurting out your hand as quickly as possible. Uh, it's more of a combo deck uh, based around hardened scales that makes cards like uh, Hangerback Walker or Arcbound Ravager super powerful. Uh, so more of a, of a combo deck uh, that can uh, power out explosive turn two or turn three kills rather than uh, an affinity deck, which is a deck with a bit more uh, staying power. That said, Bensek's uh, version has, well, you already see it there, Overgrown Tomb. That's already unusual. He has four Thoughtseize and two Dark Confidant in his, uh, in his main deck, replacing uh, you know, some, some filler-type cards that are often seen, like Welding Jar or Sparring Construct. And these black cards give him some additional uh, interaction, as well as staying power against a variety of decks. So uh, a novel innovation to a deck that... Uh, you know, put uh, a player in ninth place at a GP recently and has been doing super well on Magic Online. So I'm really excited to see this uh, in action. Yeah, Ben was talking to me and saying he's been working on uh, this iteration of the Hardened Scales deck for two, three weeks now, getting a feel for the various interactions that it has available to it and the additional options, especially in terms of sideboarding that he gains uh, after having played game ones. He said that in general he feels like in this version is less afraid of bad matchups than the uh, the more regular version of Hardened Scales. Yeah, when you have uh, access to additionally Fatal Push, Duress, and Abrupt Decay in the sideboard, uh, you do get to shore up some holes of your uh, strategy, so that's valuable. Meanwhile, Laurent is just ramping, doing what his deck is trying to do, ramping up to seven lands, uh, and then casts Scape Shift to find Velikut to Molten Pinnacle, uh, and six Mountains, which can together roast the opponent for 18 damage. Yeah, Farseek just one of a whole host of different ways that the Titan Shift deck can get a little bit ahead on the land count. Another copy of Ancient Stirrings here for Ben Sek means that his draws will get better. One of the few cards that he can't pick up with it, though, is the Hardened Scales that he sees in the top five cards there. That one is not colorless, but, uh, well, Walking Ballista is uh, also a decent pickup. Though, <laughs> without Hardened Scales, not as exciting as it could be. Uh, I do fear that this is going to be uh, one of those games where the Hardened Scales deck is just playing out a bunch of 1-1s and not doing a whole lot of stuff that looks impressive. Without the namesake card, uh, many of these uh, threats are very much unimpressive. Thought sees here will give him a fair idea of what's going on, and he gets to see a hand that has a Lightning Bolt, a Scape Shift, and then a whole bunch of lands. Get that Scape Shift out of there. One less to worry about. Very happy to deal with it now. Also, it means that for Bensek, where previously he might have thought, okay, this could be one of the, the Ponza lists or maybe a Jund list that hasn't found its black mana just yet, now he has a very clear understanding, as if the Far Seek wasn't enough to tell him already, that he's up against the Scape Shift list. Having dealt with one Scape Shift, he just needs to worry about the other three. Yeah, before seeing Laurent's hand, uh, just looking at Ben's board, I was thinking this does not look good for, uh, for Bensek, but... After seeing that Laurent didn't really have much action either, uh, it, it might be a game where a bunch of random 1-1s could get the job done. Yeah, I mean, these 1-1s each have the ability to grow in their own different ways. And right now, Laurent, the only piece of interaction he has is a lightning bolt. And anything that he bolts, he's, there's going to be a small amount of value being able to get one back by Ben Sek. Yeah, we just keep the bolt in hand. Uh, sure, bolting walking ballista. Uh, does something, but uh, it's not a great use of the card. Better save it in case Ben uh, plays a Steel Overseer next, or some other big threat. I mean, now would, now would be a good turn for Steel Overseer. I mean, then that would suggest that almost any turn is a good turn for Steel Overseer if you're playing the Hardened Scales list. For now, Ben Sek just attacking in, and we're going to see a few creatures after combat, I would imagine. 
now that he knows about Lightning Bolt, going with a big walking ballista, again, just not really presenting the kind of targets that uh, Laurent is really going to want to fire too much off against, goes for the Lightning Bolt, which in turn means that walking ballista stops walking and starts firing pieces of itself right at Caligaro's head. Yeah, now I would indeed fire off the, the bolt. Given that Bensek didn't spend his turn on a uh, steel overseer or maybe setting up some Arcbound Ravager plus Ingmont Nexus uh, kills, you do need to uh, well buy as much time as possible to eventually draw into either Scape Shift or Primeval Titan for likely to win. So it goes for Reclamation Sage on Hangerback Walker. That makes sense. If he'd gone for the Walking Ballista, it just would have shot the Sage in response anyway. Uh, well, Ben does get some, uh, some value in the process. The Topter is uh, coming in. Okay, Darksteel Citadel alongside. This might be the turn for Steel Overseer. Oh, yeah. But still, Ben's clock is not particularly uh, fast. Gets in a couple of cheeky hits here. And yeah, no point in attacking with the uh, Walking Ballista yet, uh, especially when you have Steel Overseer to uh, boost it, as well as just mana to sink into it for uh, for the next turn. Yeah, a little so awkward to do a mix of poison and regular damage, but you might as well get in the damage where you can. Yeah, well, the alternative is not attacking with Inkmont Nexus. That is always bad, at least given that Ben didn't have another way to uh, use that mana. So the board getting a little bit busier now for Ben Sec, and... The uh, copy of Steel Overseer that he has in play, if it gets to hang around here, will mean that he's got a fair amount of pump that he can use. Yeah, my guess is that uh, Ben is threatening a two-turn clock from this point. Right, He can uh, get in for well six with his uh, ground creatures, uh, seven if he sinks mana into the Ballista. Six, if you sink mana, then ping the Sage and attack with everything, and then next turn another Overseer activation. Yeah, so it's a two-turn clock, which means that uh, Laurent basically has one turn to draw into Primeval Titan or Scape Shift, uh, or it's going to be too late. Although drawing into maybe a Sweeper, Anger of the Gods, for example, well, he has Sweltering Suns in his list. That might also be uh, helpful. The supply of dice in the feature match area once again being taxed by these hardened scales players. Going to need counters for that Ink Moth Nexus and indeed the Overseer itself. And this is what mm. we like to see. Plenty of creatures hitting the red zone. Yeah, and shoot down the, the blocker to uh, maximize your damage output on this turn. It's not lethal yet, I don't think. Extra walking ballista pings after attacks might be enough to just about get it. They haven't quite added it up just yet. I don't think so yet. If there had been a hardened skills, however, <laughs> things oh would have yeah, been different. Absolutely. I think that that, I think any time that we're watching the hardened scales deck, we can kind of almost tacitly assume that anything that we say is followed by of course, if there was another copy of Hardened Scales in play, it would be spectacularly better. Yeah, and one aspect of this deck that I do like in general is that it has access to, uh, at least it, its mana base can support Ancient Stirrings. A regular affinity list has trouble casting Ancient Stirrings on turn one, just by nature of uh, its, uh, its land configuration, uh, and therefore it doesn't really help as much in you know setting up your s second land drop potentially. The Hardened Scales deck does have lots of... Uh, forests or turn one sources for ancient stirrings allowing it to uh, put the card in its deck so that uh, well if you don't have to turn one hardened skills you can at least cast ancient stirrings and set up your draws for uh, for the next turns i know that simon has been on the record a number of times as saying that he feels like ancient stirrings is the best card drawing or the best one mana card drawing spell that you're likely to see very often in um in modern to the point that it seems crazy that it's allowed when so many of the blue uh, one mana card drawing spells have already been banned. We obviously unlikely to see any of that change just yet, but Primeval Titan here, that was what uh, Lauren Caligaro needed to find to potentially be able to threaten to win back this game. Well, it is uh, probably going to be good enough. Uh, it's not a scape shift, so it doesn't win the game immediately, but uh, he does get two Velika triggers now because 
He uh, first played the Titan, then searched to Velikut, and still had a fetch land uh, open. He can take out, let's say, the Steel Overseer and maybe maybe the Top Third token, or maybe the big Walking Ballista. Um, and then he also has Primeval Titan as a as a blocker on the on the next turn. Um, let's see. So if you shoot down the Steel Overseer and let's say the the top third token well then you might actually uh right everything attacks on the next turn one creature gets blocked probably has to be the the bigger walking ballista well you might still uh survive on uh on one life before no that would also be lethal if you target walking ballista and steal overseer uh, so now, on Ben's turn, he can uh, pump the Ballista, attack with everything, can block one of the, the creatures, but then the Ballista still pings you down. Actually, I do think uh, no matter how Laurent targeted uh, with the Primeval Titan, there was no way to prevent the Ben from, uh, from winning on the next attack. I think Ben uh, has this one locked up. Deceptively powerful, tiny artifact creatures here, getting the job done. Bensek, of course, can make all of these calculations a lot easier with quite a lot of different draws. I mean, if he has, for example, an Arcbound Ravager, it means he gets to turn the Mox Opal, the Darksteel Citadel, and indeed the Ink Moth Nexus into additional plus one plus one counters to throw around. Um, a lot of different options available to him here. Yeah, a little too late. Uh, if that Primeval Titan had come down one turn earlier, uh, it would almost surely have been uh, have been enough, but here Laurent was already down to uh, well too low of a life total, and the reach provided by Walking Ballista is going to be relevant enough. Yeah, I guess Ben may have to worry about another lightning bolt, but there's no way that Laurent had a bolt in hand on a previous turn and didn't use it, and he clearly top decked uh, Primeval Titan, so you don't even have to realistically worry about that. So the pumped walking ballista providing the extra damage to be able to kill off Laurent. If he'd chosen to block the other biggest creature, which was, was Arcbound Worker, it would have represented more tokens on the walking ballista. Mm -hmm. No easy way out of that one. Off to game two with Ben Sek having picked up the game one. And for me, the, the key takeaway from, uh, from this game was uh, the Tatsis. If, uh, if the Tatsis had instead been, say, uh, a sparring construct or uh, maybe some other... Yeah, low, 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 card low in impact uh, cards. Uh, ben would have almost surely lost to uh, to escape shift when uh, Laurent hit seven lands. But uh, the addition of that uh, disruption spell in his main deck has uh, really paid off well for uh, for Ben Sack, who just needs to win one more game in this match to ad to lock up uh, a day two berth. Now, after sideboarding, he gets to bring in another duress potentially to get things going against what's going on the other side of things. I mean, in terms of the other interaction that he has, it may be pretty minimal, actually, in this matchup, what he chooses to bring in. Um, let's see, yeah, cards like Damping Sphere uh, don't help against uh, Escape Shift. Um, Pithing Needle? Like, yeah, then you just need to gamble that you name the right fetch land. That also doesn't uh, sound all that uh, appealing. And Pithing Needling, something like Velika, just doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's also not like his uh, main deck has a lot of cards that he needs to take out. It's already uh, a lean machine. So just, just adding a couple of uh, duress that uh, might, be, might be enough just to supplement uh, his start seizures. On the other but side of things, there's a lot of cards that Laurent Caligaro can lean on here if he, if he so chooses. Uh, yeah, in his sideboard he has, uh, for example, additional Anger of the Gods. Uh, a sweeper that uh, could prove to be uh, quite useful. Uh, also exile, so uh, hangerback walker won't uh, leave around any uh, top tier tokens. Um, other potentially relevant cards are engineered explosives uh, that could be uh, helpful just to uh, buy some additional uh, time. Uh, Nature's claim, of course, another one for one removal. He doesn't have like the the real big haymakers like uh, ancient grudge or uh, he has one ancient grudge. Oh yeah, he does. Uh, well, that's uh, at least one. Uh, or Creeping Corrosion, don't really see that uh, either. But 
Adding a couple of sweepers, a couple of artifact removal spells means that uh, Laurent is probably going to improve more than, uh, than Ben. Though I guess that is typical when you're playing uh, a deck with Mox Opal. Generally speaking, opponents uh, will have some artifact removal in their sideboards. Yeah, this is definitely a format where if you're not prepared for artifacts, I think it's fair to say you're just not prepared. No. All right, so on to game two. It'll be Laurent Caligaro on the play, and he kicks things off with the wooded foothills here. Yeah, some people have uh, ha had asked me before the, the tournament, do you believe that uh, Hardened Skills is just uh, a better version of, uh, of Affinity? Uh, my answer to that was that uh, the two decks are, are just different. They are both uh, competitive, but uh, Hardened Skills is better at setting up really quick, you know, turn three kills, more explosive, uh, really sweet when you have that Hardened Skills, but you also have a bit too many hands where you just have a bunch of 1-1s one -ones and don't have uh, a great clock. Affinity uh, is better when uh, specifically Edge Champion equipped with uh, Cranial Plating is uh, relevant in the, in the metagame. Yeah, I mean, our Outbound Worker obviously is available to Affinity if it wants it, and it hasn't wanted it for some number of years now. No, Affinity typically runs uh, Signal Pest and, and Volt Scourge going for the, uh, the Flying Evasion, which pairs really well with uh, Cranial Plating. The Hardened Skills deck is based more around yeah, plus one, plus one counter synergies. Uh. So just a pass here from Lauren Caligaro, potentially holding a little bit of removal for whatever it is comes on the other side of things. But that Dark Confidant that we talked about a little bit before the match started, Ben did just draw one. So if he's got access to Black Mana here, we may see him show off one of the more unusual choices in his speci specific uh, Hardened Scales list. It's going to be uh, Bob Maher's Invitational card, Dark Confidant. Good proof to give him some uh, sweet value turn after turn. And if it works out that Lauren Caligaro, the sideboard cards that he's found are artifact removal, they're not going to do quite so much against mm -hmm. Bob himself. Greatness at any cost. One of the better flavor texts. Uh, on a card. And so see? that was Lauren just double checking whether or not the counter gets moved across when it comes to non artifact creatures. The answer is no, sir. Modular, <laughs> it's all about the artifacts. It's been a long time since I uh, saw Arkband Worker. Uh, maybe you have to go all the way back to uh, Mirrodin block, basically, where it was a mainstay in the uh, block constructed affinity deck. I gotta say that this hardened skills deck. Um, it doesn't really rely or use um, cards that have been printed recently. I mean, some versions have, I guess, Sparring Construct and Dampening Sphere from uh, Dominaria, but uh, most of the cards have been uh, legal for a while, ever since uh, Walking Ballista was, uh, was printed. It just took people quite a long time to find the, the proper version. Um, I guess getting away from the whole Ornithopter, Springleaf Drum, Cranial Plating is wasn't an obvious deck building direction, so just took a while for people to uh, to find it, basically. But And no. now that there's one good Walking Ballista and Hanging Back Walker deck, suddenly there's more than one, with uh, Bridgevine also being a deck <laughs> yeah. that likes to lean on those ones. Yeah, but that deck, uh, uh, f for that deck, the typical mode is just playing it for zero mana and having it die immediately. So Every piece <laughs> of the buffalo, my friend. Somewhere <laughs> yeah. or other, everyone's finding a way of using those ones. Still Overseer and Arcbound Ravager coming down for Ben Sek here. And that prompting the flashback on uh, Ancient Grudge. Arkbound Ranger now up to being a 2 2. Yeah, often Steel Overseer is a bigger threat than, uh, than Arkbound Ravager because the repeated activations, uh, in the long term at least, add more power to the, to the board. Although, depending on what uh, Ben has in hand, he might be able to uh, start sacrificing his artifacts to Arkbound Ravager going for an aggressive line, putting the pressure on and just trying to get in for as much damage as possible to, uh, well, maybe in an attempt to win the game before Laurent hits uh, uh, seven mana. Also, something relevant to point out is that uh, seven land scape shift, it will deal 18 damage in, uh, in total. It's a Velikut plus six mountains, that's uh, 18 damage. With Ben still at 20, hasn't taken any damage from, from an overgrown tomb. Uh, he can still survive such a scape shift. So that was an Ancient Stirrings into Mox Opal. Sacrificed the first Mox Opal before playing the second. 
So essentially that was an ancient steering that generated one counter at the cost of no mana, I guess. Unfortunately for Ben, he's not really threatening too much damage here unless he wants to move very deep in with sacrificing copies of Darksteel Citadel. Yeah, this is getting a bit uh, risky in the sense that he doesn't have a backup artifact creature. Right, if he had uh, just any artifact creature, doesn't even matter, an Arkbound Rourke or whatever, you can just go all in on Ravager, knowing that uh, if Mara has a single removal spell, well, you can always move over the, the counters to your other backup creature. But here it is, it, it does feel pretty risky in the face of a potential, uh, I don't know, nature's claim. Well, an Arkbound Worker is the pickup, so Ben does have his backup creature now. I say go for it. I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> don't answer that. There are many, many things that could go oh wrong yes. with this plan. But, I mean, at the moment, Benzek is ahead on life. Um, the, while the Valakut is down for Lauren Caragario here, on its own, it's not going to be enough for... Um, hmm. Not sure what to think game. of this, uh, this line. You could also just sacrifice uh, Mox Opal and or Darksteel Citadel to threaten uh, a two-turn clock while still having the Arkbound Worker as, uh, as a backup. But at least Ben is using uh, nicely the, the modular ability on uh, the Worker. Uh, because the Worker itself gives a, gives a, a counter uh, and the activated ability of Arkbound Ravager adds a counter. means that one Arkbound Worker equals two plus one plus one counters on Arkbound Ravager. And I guess if Ben draws an X creature like Hangerback Walker or uh, Walking Ballista, he may be happy that he still has uh, the Citadel and the Mox Opal lying around. But he is opening himself up a bit more vulnerable to, uh, let's say, a top-decked uh, Nature's Claim, for example. So, as things stand, Lauren Clar Caligaro has to do something big this very turn. Yes, he is facing lethal on the next. Oh, well, there is the uh, escape something shift. pretty big. But, as you so rightly noted, 20 life, this scape shift representing 18 damage, he's going to have to split some of that damage onto the Arcbound Ravager. Uh, yes, he, he, he cannot win the game on this turn unless he had, say, another Lightning Bolt uh, in hand or another uh, ramp card. Um, that said, Ben clearly does not have anything of relevance uh, left in hand, so you can just uh, point three triggers at the Ravager. You do need uh, at least three, because if you only point two, then... Uh, ben will just sacrifice an artifact in response to save it. Uh, and then, yeah, you put Ben down to, I guess, 11 life. And you have a Velikut on the table with Ben out of, uh, out of threats. That does put Laurent in a, in a really good spot. Because at this point for Laurent, any spell is, you know, that's going to be useful. That's a spell. Any land, well, that's probably going to trigger the Velikut. So that also adds uh, some value. It'll be tough for Ben to uh, claw out of this. Yeah, every draw is a live draw now for Laurent, and I'm not quite sure what draws it is that uh, Ben is hoping to find here to get himself <laughs> back in this. One Unscales. turn too late. Yeah, last turn would have been <laughs> yeah. would have been lethal, in fact. Uh, yes, almost uh, almost surely. This turn, however, not gonna do it. That is uh, a very sad top deck. Like uh, Ben's deck is just uh, laughing in his face. I guess if you. Let's see, if you draw Walking Ballista here, no, that's still not going to help against a mountain. Maybe if you draw a Hangerback Walker and Laurent has a really bad hand, might be able to get there with the hardened skills. But uh, Laurent is super far ahead if we had an advantage bar. And I guess this will... Uh, this I mean should lock it up, assuming that Laurent still has enough mountains in his deck, but uh, he, he probably knows his own list. He probably knows how many mountains are in there should uh, be able to get there. One Valakut, two Mountains. There are enough Mountains in play that all those Valakuts will trigger, and we get to go on to a game three. The kind of, the bright side, I guess, of that game not going so well. You can see there Ben looking pretty pleased, even considering uh, how that game went for him. Always a smile on that one's face. I mean, it was a good, it was a good game. Uh, he uh, was able to uh, do what his deck was meant to do for, uh, for a large part. Put Laurent down to uh, a low life total, Almost got there, uh, and I'm just happy to see that uh, Ben, win or lose, is uh, having uh, having a good time playing Magic here. Yeah, something of a world traveler when it comes to Magic. Uh, originally from Australia, for a long while lived in the United States, currently living in Spain, uh, and 
wherever he may happen to be, if there's a Magic tournament, there's a good chance that he's going to be showing up. Yep. Um, Primo Janitor from the chat is asking, is that really the Bensec? Yes, indeed it is. His nickname, TBS, the one and only uh, Bensec. He gets yep. around a little bit, and he's made it all the way to Prague for this weekend. Currently 5-1, and one, just needing one more win to make it into day two. Uh, can either get it this round or next if he absolutely has to. This one going to a game three. Each of these guys will be much happier if they can lock up their day two a little bit sooner, potentially put together a 7-1. Seven, 7-1, one. Seven, one, a great finish on mm. day one. Um, just one match win behind the pace. Yeah, when you uh, enter day two at an X2 record, then uh, you then your uh, back is uh, on the ropes. You probably cannot lose any other match if you still want to make it to the to the top eight in the end. Yeah, this is a very large GP as they come. Uh, we heard yep. the numbers, the final tally from the scorekeepers, actually 1,999. Indeed, it's one off of 2,000. Uh, we were all pretty sad when we got the number. It could have been any of you guys. <laughs> Each and every one of you has exactly the same amount of reason to feel like oh, I, could, I could have been number 2,000. Hopefully but not at the end of the weekend on the, on the score table in terms of where you finish. Hopefully a little higher than that, but you know, you never know. Even if you're just here to have a good time, there's plenty of good times to be had. Uh, incidentally, for those of you that are joining us uh, just sort of this last couple of rounds, we had an announcement earlier on uh, today from our coverage manager here, Rich Hagen, about some cool things that are going on with coverage at our next GP, uh, and we'll be repeating that message at the end of this round, so stay tuned for that. If you're looking to find out some other cool stuff that we're just innovating in terms of coverage just for this very next GP. So, it looks like a mulligan here for Lauren Carag Caragaro and a card to the bottom, so potentially a bit of an awkward draw for him, but turn one hardened scales, is that the best start for this deck? It must be close. Uh, well, I mean, the best start probably involves uh, some Mox Opals as well on, uh, on turn one, but uh, uh, it is uh, close to the dream start for this deck. Hardened Scales is uh, the engine that makes all the other cards in the deck tick. So your draws where you do have the enchantment are so much better than, uh, than all the other ones. Arcbound Worker, suddenly a 2-2 two -two for one, with a little bit of upside with in upside, terms of that yeah. modular ability. When it dies, oh. it gets to move three counters onto another yes. artifact creature, but only the one land. This might be the opening that Lauren Caligaro needs. Yeah, this, uh, it started off really well on turn one for uh, Ben Sack, but uh, turn two has not been as yeah. kind uh, to him. I did spot Mox Opal in his hand, so if Laurent gives him uh, an opportunity to maybe resolve another artifact and then uh, you know, be able to get some mana out of the, the Mox Opals, potentially this turn could be quite explosive, but missing that second land drop definitely is uh, a big hamper on the development. All right, just an attack for two from Arcbound Worker. I mean, there weren't too many cards that were going to pump it pre-combat. Well, sometimes you can uh, just go off with Arcbound Ravager and uh, uh-oh, no play at all. That yeah. does not bode well for, uh, for Mr. Sec. Um, like, this deck is capable of uh, turn two kills, potentially. I actually had uh, uh, one when I was uh, playing it on, on Magic Online earlier this week, where you go turn one, and our Dark Souls Citadel, Welding Jar, Mox Opal, Arcbound Ravager, then turn two, uh, just play another Dark Souls Citadel, at a hardened scales, suddenly every artifact that you sacrifice to Arcbound Ravager will give him plus two, plus two. Also cast a Walking Ballista, get in with the Arcbound Ravager for nearly 10 damage, and then post combat just move all the counters over to the Walking Ballista to ping your opponent for lethal. Um, so. If you compare that to the current draw that Ben has, it does indicate that uh, there's a lot of variance in the power of the opening hands of this Hardened Skills deck. Uh, some are ridiculous, some are extremely uh, lackluster. Yeah, that is just what you have in to a accept. Way. Yeah, ridiculous in as uh, in like a very powerful uh, way. Yes. Yeah. So, search for tomorrow here potentially into another spell from uh, Caligaro if he's. Able to deal with Arcban Worker this turn, I feel like it's definitely all over. If all he's doing is, well, <laughs> he's able to do slightly better. This is a slaughter. Engineered explosives blowing up both hardened scales and Arcbound Worker. This mulligan worked out pretty well here for Lauren Caligaro. Six lands in play. Finally, Ben finds his second land, but it may be too late here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Ben took uh, took a gamble, um, and maybe one that seems reasonable with his deck because having hardened scales in your opening hand is worth so much, and perhaps even worth the risk of not drawing uh, another land in your next two draw steps. But uh, certainly didn't work out for him, and now uh, he was hoping to catch Laurent with you know one business spell and uh, nothing else. And but if this uh, is a land, this is game over. Yeah, because Tati's he's put Ben Sek down to 18 life. No lands. I think he's actually. He might think Still he might alive. be at 16 because he's. He also had to play the overgrown. Two oh yes, tap. that is true. Yeah, yeah. So it may be that our life totals are just a little bit uh, on the fritz. No. So here comes Dark Confidant. I guess once you're already a little bit down, you might as well. I mean, there there's a big difference between 19 and 18 when playing against Cape Shift. But any life totals below 18 are not all that relevant anymore. Well, Laura is not drawing lands uh, and. Also not drawing uh, mana ramp cards. Also not drawing Primeval Titan, he would have played that. So my guess is that Laurent has a bunch of... Artifact removal? Like, like if it was a bolt or something, I, I, w I would assume he would have just cast it on the, on the Dark Confidant. So yeah, maybe artifact removal. And if that is indeed the case, then uh, uh, good old Bob Mahar is uh, showing why he is uh, a good sideboard card against decks with artifact removal, because they dodge the, the hate cards that people bring in. Rising Canopy, and slightly painful land potentially, but at least it can draw cards as well. It's an optimistic outbound Ravager! <laughs> um, Fluttershy from the chat is asking, is Hardened Skills a real deck? Uh, well, from this particular game uh, of Bensec, you might not really think it is all that powerful, but uh, yes, it is a real deck, it is a competitive deck. And it actually put uh, an astonishing three players uh, in the top eight of the Magic Online Championship Series uh, recently, which is a highly competitive uh, online event. Um, it is a real deck in modern. And pretty sweet and fun to play too. Finally, Mox Opal getting enough artifacts in play to be able to do something. Immediately getting sacrificed to Arkbound Ravager, having generated a little bit of mana in the meantime. Is there another Mox Opal here to potentially cast a two mana spell? There is. All right. And a walking ballista. Well, uh, imagine that Hardened Skills was still on the battlefield. Uh, if it were, maybe Ben Sack would have actually have cobbled together a win uh, at this spot. I mean, even if he puts down a Hardened Scales this next turn, it might still be possible. What, does Somehow, what, what is Laurent drawing? He, he has he, six lands and a scape shift in hand. And three cards that are not lands, not ramp cards, probably not Primeval Titan either, not... Not a sweeper. What could he even? What could he even I mean, be? Surely this isn't just a slow roll. That wouldn't be fair. Also, slow rolling with a sorcery against this deck feels very dangerous. I mean, I guess he could be drawing scape shifts. He could have like four scape shifts in hand. Yeah. I, regardless of how this game goes, I really hope that we get a chance to see a little bit more of what's going on in Lauren's hand. I'm handling. really curious. So, Hangerback Walker joining alongside Arkbound Ravager. And, yeah, suddenly we've got a wide old board here for Ben Sek. And I, I do believe that he will be able to uh, assemble lethal here um, by just sacrificing a bunch of artifacts to the Arkbound Ravager, putting Laurent down to uh, a relatively low life total, and then afterwards potentially moving them over to uh, Walking Ballista. Um, you could even play around the Lightning Bolt, potentially if you... Uh, go really uh, really deep and keep the other Ravager in play so that you can respond to uh, to a bolt. So that was sacrificing Arcbound Ravager to Arcbound Ravager but then moving a counter onto Walking Ballista with the Arcbound Ravager that was sacrificed ability. Yeah. Uh, but this should also uh, probably be uh, be enough. Oh, it was four, four scape shift. shifts. shifts. Oh my Incredible. goodness. Incredible. You can see the look on Ben Sex's face. He <laughs> dodged four <laughs> different bullets there all at the same time. A little bit of matrix action from him. <laughs> finds the win, advances to six and one, and we'll be seeing some more of Ben Sec on Sunday. Wow. <laughs> I mean, we, we were sitting here trying to figure out what Laurent could have in hand. Eventually, we, we speculated could it be four scape shift? And like, wh what, are the, what are the odds? Definitely less than, than 1%. This. This almost never happens. Wow. Every, pr pretty much every other draw in this deck would have been lethal. 
yeah. a land, a ramp card. Acceleration cards. spells, yeah, even, any of it. Yeah. yeah. Even, even wow. something like a Primeval Titan that wouldn't necessarily have been the kill that exact turn would have at least dealt with most of the board and set up the yeah, kill. Yeah, it so would likely have uh, brought him an unsurmountable board state. Ben Sek, I mean, the smile on his face there, <laughs> he knew how lucky he just got. I, I, I did like that both players could uh, could crack a smile at uh, the sight of that ridiculous hand. Absolutely that's, insane. That's sometimes how it goes in Magic. Absolutely is. We will have more Magic for you after these messages. Hello and welcome back to coverage of this round seven of Grand Prix Prague. Now, during that little ad break, we did have uh, a little bit of maths time with Frankie Numbers. And based on the assumption that there were about 40 cards or so left in, uh, 
in the deck there when the first scape shift was shown to be in hand. What are our rough odds on the exact way that the game turned out? Uh, so then the, the probability of drawing three consecutive scape shifts, it's uh, 0 0.01%. So wow. that is, uh, it is something that almost never happens. So 99.99% of the time, you draw something that's not a scape shift, and we believe that almost anything that's not a scape shift results in that matchup going the other way. Yeah. Hey, that's why you play it out. That's magic. But we are going to get a chance to see a little bit more magic for you now. We're going to jump back down to our feature match area, starting in game two here with blue-white control up against Grixis Shadow. Thomas Hendricks with Grixis Shadow up against Arseniy Igorov on the other side of things. Currently a game up with blue-white control. And blue-white control uh, is actually a deck that uh, a lot of the three by pros uh, in particular chose for this uh, event. Uh, it's a deck that uh, gained a lot from uh, the last year. Um, in Ixalan you had Opt, Search for Scanta, Field of Ruin, uh, and then in this year we also gained uh, Jace and Teferi. So it is a deck that has gained a lot, it has always been good, and uh, yeah, people also ultimately perfected uh, the, the last couple of slots, just polished uh, the deck all in all. Also spoke with Ivan Vlog, who was uh, one of the many players playing the deck. He claimed that uh, it was also reasonably well positioned in a metagame right now, because Few people were playing cards like Duck Dark Confidant, Liliana, Bloodbraid Elf, those kinds of decks which might otherwise be uh, problematic. So he and many of the other 3 by pros felt that uh, White Blue Control was the best. Thomas Hendricks, on the other hand, still put his faith in, uh, in Grixis' Shadow. And Hendricks is one of the players that has played with various iterations of Death Shadow lists for quite some time now. I can definitely see why leaning on experience makes sense. Uh, kicks things off with a Watery Grave, a Serum Visions, and Mishra's Bauble. Doesn't elect to use the Bauble yet, and that's kind of one of the interesting things that sometimes with the Bauble, you want to give yourself as much time to get information. Waits until after a sin he's drawn, checks the top card of his deck, and then in his upkeep, immediately draws a card. I think the main reason why Thomas uh, waited uh, to activate the more Bauble so that he could see the top card right now is that he wants to play Totsies here. Uh, and this ensures that he has full information on what uh, Igorov is, uh, is working with. So the Grixis Shadow list, early doors, does not mind hurting itself at all. Get that life total down below 13 so that Death Shadow is a one-mana threat that can get cast that's only going to get larger. And against blue-white control, there's not actually that many ways that uh, Arsini is going to be helping Hendrix lower his life total in the early and mid stages of this game. So. Hendrix having to do all the damage, I would, I would say the old-fashioned way, but this is the exact opposite of old-fashioned. Thought sees as a way of getting down to 13, and here he sees four lands. Then he's got Search for Iskanta, Cryptic Command, and a Detention Sphere there to deal with. Any thoughts, Frank, on what might be the best pickup from that hand? Uh, this also depends on what Thomas saw on top of uh, Igorov's library. Often with Thought sees, you want to pick some kind of unique effect, uh, try to poke a hole in, uh, in the opponent's hand which could mean uh, breaking up the curve or uh, taking a card uh, that uh, gives you an angle of attack. I guess uh, when you have, um, well, I guess you have uh, Inquisition, so you might as well take two. Yeah, when you have two discard spells, uh, making sure that uh, Igorov will not have a way to uh, affect the board in any relevant way or affect the game in any relevant way uh, for the next two turns is going to be the most uh, valuable. Sure, maybe Cryptic Command is the arguably the most powerful card in hand, but breaking up uh, a mana curve is, uh, is more valuable, especially when uh, you can make sure that you can resolve and stick uh, a Death Shadow in the meantime. Yeah. That Cryptic Command is going to be too late to stop uh, that particular threat. A Death Shadow was the pickup this turn, and what uh, Polluted Delta into a Steam Vents means that Thomas Hendricks gets to drop himself down to 10 life, a one mana 3 3, not too bad, and it's only going to get better from here on out. It is possible, of course, that Arseny Egorov uh, will have brought in ways of gaining a little bit of life here and there, but he's not the only one that's no. had a chance to sideboard because Goblin Ravel Master, the addition for Thomas Hendricks, this not a card that I would necessarily expect to see in Death Shadow lists, but on an empty board, a Goblin Ravel Master can do a lot of damage. Indeed, this is uh, one of the, the spice uh, that uh, Thomas added to his uh, sideboard. 
and it is meant specifically for matchups uh, like these where you just need a few additional uh, additional threats and it will be hard for uh, Igorov to uh, to deal with and presents a pretty fast clock by itself. So timely reinforcements here will not gain uh, the blue-white control player <laughs> any life whatsoever because Thomas Hendricks has done a great job on keeping his life title low. However, three soldier tokens do mean that these goblins are not going to be able to be gobbling on uh, Igorov's life total just yet. Nope. A couple of copies of Death Shadow and a Stubborn Denial in hand for uh, Hendrix here. So, oh, sorry, that was a thought scan. My apologies. But still, two copies of Death Shadow in hand. If Hendrix wants to turn the screws here a little bit, he really can. Having cycled the Street Wraith as well, there's the Stubborn Ooh. Denial. That's also pretty good. Uh, gives him some protection from perhaps a, uh, a top deck terminus because the dead shadow will be uh, big enough to turn on the ferocious yeah now I'm curious what uh, Igorov wants to do I guess he can uh, just block these uh, goblin tokens to protect his life total but if he does that then he will eventually miss jump blockers to uh, stay alive against an attacking goblin rebel master or dead shadow you might also try to take it in the hope of uh, well, keeping some jump blockers around for these uh, bigger creatures. But yeah, Thomas is doing a really good job of pressuring uh, Egorov. And I do like that he didn't add the second Dead Shadow to the, to the board because that opens him up to, uh, you know, some sweeper like a top deck uh, Terminus. Better to keep up that Stubborn Denial. Yeah, and, and it having it next turn is not really going to slow him down all that much. And it just means he's much, much safer. Yeah, and Igorov, uh, well, he has Cryptic Command, which is always a nice and powerful card. But, uh, he, yeah, he doesn't really have great modes for it. He can tap down all of Thomas' creatures and draw a card. Uh, but that only you know, delays the inevitable in a way. I guess he can uh, try to uh, bounce and draw something like a Goblin Rebel Master at the end of the turn. Then hope to draw into something good to uh, counter it on the next. He does go for the tap and draw. Thought Scarron response here. Two lands in the graveyard and disruptive dis disdainful stroke. Disdainful sorry. stroke is the card uh, he, uh, he drew. Counter an expensive card I in mean, terms of mana cost. Cryptic Command does qualify as that but as things stand Thomas just allows this uh, Cryptic Command to resolve here. Yeah, generally speaking when you are ahead in a game and Thomas is ahead here you have to play to dare outs. As in, think about uh, what are the cards that my opponent could draw uh, to win the game from this point. Try to envision that. And make sure that uh, your line of play is not vulnerable to that. If Thomas had countered uh, the Cryptic Command, then um, Igorov could, for example, draw a Sweeper uh, on his turn, sweep the board, and suddenly turn the game around. You don't want to give uh, your opponent that kind of option if you are in Thomas' position. And I liked playing the Death Shadow after combat because it means that now this turn he untaps and has access to two different pieces of counter magic if it works out that uh, a number of pow powerful threats are coming from the other side of the things. Obviously a Supreme Verdict, that will just wipe out the board regardless, but you might as well give yourself outs against the other ways that uh, Egorov could get things going here. A whole bunch of goblins led by a couple of Death Shadow coming in. So this uh, attack for 14 here. At some point, there's going to have to be a few creatures thrown in the way, I would imagine. Yeah, you definitely have to uh, start jump blocking uh, here. Well, I guess it's not technically lethal if you don't block, but... A uh, cycled Street Wraith would be enough. I, I don't think uh, those 1-1 one -one tokens are going to do uh, anything better than preventing some, uh, some damage by blocking a Dead Shadow. Um, you were chatting about uh, Supreme Verdict. Igorov does have one copy in his uh, deck. But like most uh, white-blue decks uh, that we see right now, especially uh, with the addition of Jace, uh, many of them rely more on Terminus. He has four copies of that. And Terminus can be countered. Yeah, if you're Thomas Hendricks right now, every Wait. reason to feel fairly good about how this game's going. There is a Condemn in hand for uh, Egorov, and that is a very good card against the likes of Death Shadow. Uh, that... Uh Condemning a Goblin Rebel Master, uh, if Thomas decides to attack with everything, could be super powerful. 
because then not only do you deal with one of the attacking threats, but the power of the Rebel Master may be high enough to put Thomas back to uh, 13 or higher, and then you take down the Death Shadows as well. I do think that Thomas has a fetch land to protect him from that as well as, of course, the Stubborn Denial, but uh, we'll see how this uh, plays out. So, Celestial Colonnade getting animated here as a potential blocker. And Thomas has this member, so might as well try to kill it uh, before blockers. Also paying some life to make the Dead Shadows even bigger. And he's very carefully working out exactly how much life he wants to pay, because of course he does have access to black mana. Uh, ultimately elects to pay two points of life here. Now this, Not of course, means that those Death Shadows, large enough, but his life total a little bit safer. I mean, he should be able to uh, win the game on, uh, on this attack, especially with the uh, Stubborn Denial still uh, available. Um, I guess Thomas might be thinking, well, if I just forget something that my opponent might have, don't want to randomly put myself down to four and then lose to an attacking uh, Celestial Colonnade on the next turn. Who knows what uh, cards there might be in the format that I'm forgetting. So, Condemn does target a Death Shadow, and look how quickly this Stubborn Denial causes every single card on the table to get scooped up, because it is enough to secure the win in Game 2. We'll get a chance to jump across to our Game 3 now by the wonders of Time Warp Magic. Straight through the Mulligan stage, we get to just see Thomas Hendricks scry to the bottom. He has the Goblin Rabble Master again, he has Mishra's Bauble, but he only has six cards to work with just in these early stages. Well, a very threat-heavy hand for uh, for Hendrix. Rebel Master and Gurmok uh, Anglers. Now he he may not really have the the setup or the, the card draw spells needed to uh, fill up his graveyard quickly for all of those elf creatures. He did use the Mishra's Bauble on himself uh, because he had fetch oh, no, lands he in hand. And he, he d actually does have Todd's Car, so looks like he does have all the tools uh, necessary. And yeah, using the bubble on yourself before uh, potentially deciding whether or not to, uh, to shuffle can always be, uh, be a nice play. Thought Scar has a few more cards to the graveyard, finds himself a Death Shadow. Todd's Car is essentially Dark Ritual when you have Grimlock Angler in your hand. Works so well. Already so simply gets six cards into the graveyard. That is what this deck is uh, designed to do, basically. All the other cards are there to uh, make sure that you can cast high power black cards, uh, black threats for just one mana. Both the Dead Shadow and the Gurmok Angler by themselves are, you know, kind of uh, mediocre cards. But uh, when you have them in uh, the right setup, in the right deck, it is uh, an excellent deal for a single black mana. I think it was Patrick Chapin that we first saw casting incredibly fast Gurmag Anglers, and it didn't take too long for everyone else to realize that when it comes to Delve, there are lots and lots of great options. Many of the, the best Delve spells are already now banned in Modern because they've proven that powerful. It's that easy to get cards into the graveyard. Yeah. But the Angler, hanging around at least for now. And one of the first times I saw uh, Death Shadow being uh, put to good use was several years ago when uh, Japanese deck builder uh, Matsugan um, unveiled his uh, Death Shadow Zoo deck, which was way more aggressive uh, with uh, some other zoo type uh, one drops. But uh, eventually the, the perfect version of uh, Death Shadow got perfected, and now the, the Greek Sis version. It's uh, the, the most common one. Who'd have thunk it? The best version of such and such <laughs> a deck happens to be the blue one that has more card drawing and counter magic. Whatever next. Van Dillen click here, revealing a pretty busy looking hand here for Thomas Hendricks. He's got Death Shadow, he's got another Gurmag Angler, there's a Mishra's Bauble and a Goblin Rabble Master. And the Rabble Master, the one that gets sent away, this all in Hendricks draw step here. Finds another land. And one way or another, Igorov won't be able to prevent Hendrix from uh, adding an additional threat to his uh, to his board. But Rebel Master was probably the the one that is most difficult to deal with, or at least when you might uh, find some paths or exiles later on. Then you still have the 
goblin tokens to contend with. As things stand, Hendrix once again doing a good job of knocking down his own life total here. Though with a Vendillion click on the board, I guess in principle you need to be a little bit more careful about dropping too low here. True, it is uh, doing a good job at, uh, at racing. On the other hand, if Hendrix resolves uh, Dead Shadow here, then I'm also not entirely sure that Egerov wants, uh, wants to attack. Of course, it always depends on, uh, on your hand, but sometimes when you're playing against uh, a Dead Shadow deck, the right play is uh, not to attack, even if it looks like free damage. And that's something that I think a lot of players, when the Death Shadow list first appeared, found themselves struggling to really figure out what the right side of it was on it. More often than not, the Death Shadow deck seems to be pretty happy getting low on life until it's very low on life. Yeah. Well, maybe Egerov, uh, given that he has Cryptic Command in hand, he, he has lots of lines available to him. He could go on the aggressive and then uh, tap down uh, Hendrix's board and try to win in two turns, uh, also given that he has Celestial Colonnade to attack in the air. It's, uh, it's a game plan, all right? I think if he wants to go for that, he should have tapped Thomas's creatures in his upkeep to uh, play around a counter magic uh, drawn in the draw step. But either way, that does seem likely to be the play uh, that Egerov might make. I guess another uh, possible line that he has access to is just bouncing the uh, Gurmok Angler, because he did see that uh, Hendrix has another Gurmok Angler in hand, and I mean, the first one is uh, is useful, but then after delving your entire graveyard, the second one, not so much. Yeah, I mean, sooner or later uh, you find yourself angle locked, and as we all know, the angle lock, one of the moves that's very difficult <laughs> to escape from. Yeah. But that would be the, let's say, the, the long-term uh, plan, where you just... Uh, planning to deal with all of your opponent's threats one for one. It looks like Egerov's game plan is uh, revolving around a damage race. It may mean, uh, may mean that uh, Egerov needs to draw another Cryptic Command so that he can tap down uh, Hendrix's board for another turn. If he does find a second Cryptic, then between Vendillion Click and Celestial Colonnade, I do believe that he will uh, come out ahead in this, uh, in this race. That always used to be one of the, the big plays that we saw from Fairy's decks of old. Everything seemed to be going perfectly fine for the other player, and then back-to-back -back, uh, the de sorry, back to back to um, Cryptic Commands, just mm. gradually meaning that from nowhere almost, the Fairy's deck was able to close it out. Here there's just the one Fairy in play, but there's now also Teferi. <laughs> so we've kind of got a, Tefe a Fairy deck uh, going on here. That is a stretch. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll allow it. Um, it doesn't help Egerov all that much. Sure, deals with one threat, but uh, can you even attack here? Puts Thomas down to five, so now the Dead Shadow is eight. Uh, oh, wait, the, the, the Dead Shadow is gone. What am I saying? Never mind. Uh, yeah, this actually works. And with so many fetch lands, Thomas Hendricks now really doesn't want to crack them. Firstly, because his life total is getting a little precarious, and secondly, because... If he does so, he's shuffling away what he knows is a threat in a deck that doesn't have tons of spare threats to, to play around with. Oh. Yeah, Egerov, is he, if he has a land on the next turn, he will uh, secure a lethal attack between the Clique and uh, the Celestial Colonnade. And Hendrix is just sitting with a bunch of lands in hand. He may try to act very confidently, you know, uh, do a bit of bluffing, trying to represent something. Because it is... It is it does feel kind of dangerous for Egerov to uh, go for this line of, well, activate my uh, uh, colonnade, attack you with everything. Uh, because if Hendrix has a dismember, which already revealed in the previous game, you just basically lose on the spot. Does Egerov dare to go uh, all in, essentially? I mean, these are the sorts of uh, decisions that really put players to the test. And you can see Egerov, he's not just jumping in on this one, head in hands, really thinking hard about what he wants to do here. All right, this is the easy bit. Let's draw a card with Teferi. That's literally the only thing that the Planeswalker <laughs> can do right now. Sure. Maybe he'll provide an answer that otherwise wasn't available. There's a Path to Exile in hand. A Path to Exile on its own is not really enough to change this situation too much. Uh, I think if you have two removal spells, uh, then I would probably not go for the, for the all-in attack because uh, you can just deal with the Gurmok Anglers and just try to win uh, a slower game. If your hand is not great, and I see, I think 
opt and pass the exile. Uh, maybe just maybe you just have to go for it and, and gamble that uh, Thomas doesn't have the this member because if Thomas actually has to this member and you don't go for the attack with this hand, which is relatively weak, are you really winning the game? Also doesn't seem particularly likely. And I'll bet that right now Thomas Hendricks is really just doing everything that he can to project as much confidence as makes sense because he doesn't <laughs> want to oversell it and you know force the call on that bluff but Thomas Hendricks knows that he just he just wants to get through this turn okay yeah overselling it is uh, is dangerous because uh, let's say a, some wisdom on bluffing is that uh, you well when you're uh, when you don't have it you tend to uh, uh, act strong when you're weak, act weak when you're strong. That is indeed what I was looking for. Frank Caro. But, uh, but uh, as things stand, that is enough for the victory there. Uh, Hendricks will have to find his win next round if he wants to be playing on day two. But you know what? He's got a good deck. He's got a good plan. He's just got one more round in which to find that victory. That is the end of our round for this round. But we do have that little announcement I teased earlier on. For those of you that weren't around earlier on today, a bit of an announcement for how coverage is going to go for the legacy the GP next weekend from Rich Hagen. Take it away, Rich.